Hey, welcome everybody. This is Troy Kilpatrick, the Executive Director for the Journey Museum and Learning Center. Thank you all for joining us tonight for another edition of uh, Journey Discussions. And I see we've got folks coming into the discussion room, Bob. See, it's hard to keep track of everybody here, but uh, we've got a super great guest tonight, Mr. Bob Riggio. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to be a part of a Journey discussion before, we host these live and we record them so that you can watch them later on demand. But if you're attending this uh, Journey discussion with us tonight, you're going to be able to send a question to me on the chat. I'll gather that up while Bob's doing his presentation. And then later we'll have a little Q&A uh, with, uh, with you guys in as part of the program tonight. So, uh, a journey discussions next Thursday, mark on your calendar. We got Joyce Jefferson joining us and Joyce is presenting a program called Shiro's and it's on three African-American, uh, ladies who are pioneer settlers. And, uh, it's, it's a great, it's really a women in history story. March was women in history month. We're putting it out in April because that was with all things going the way it is, it was just as soon as we could get it done. I do need to let you all know that the South Dakota Arts Council is providing support for Joyce and for the journey to help make this program free to our community members. So please sign in next Thursday, six o'clock, see Joyce Jefferson uh, join us. We'll take a couple weeks off. Coming up in May, we're going to have Rick Mills, who is the uh, head guy at the South Dakota Railroad Museum. He's going to come in and talk about uh, the Mickelson Trail, because, you know, we'll be in May and we're all going to want to get outside and hike. And Rick's going to tell the history story of the Mickelson Trail. And about mid-month, we're going to celebrate the journey, turning 24 years of age and kind of give you a sneak peek of all of our summer uh, programming that we're going to be shifting into. Uh, so watch us at journeymuseum.org. Sign up to get our emails so you know what's coming up next. And uh, Again, you can go back and you can watch a journey discussion that we've already uh, hosted. We started these a few months ago. And we got a nice collection online. So you guys are all here not to listen to me tonight. You're here to listen to Mr. Bob Riggio, who is a, a local legend here for all of us. Uh, he's been serving our community um, for, I'll let Bob tell the story of how many years. Uh, I'm not trying to get yeah. at him here, but uh, he uh, he is the chief meteorologist at Rapid City's KNBN TV, uh, and he's written a book uh, which has inspired our conversation to a degree tonight. Uh, but we're going to talk about the weather behind the D-Day's forecast. A little bit about Bob. Uh, during his career, Bob has earned the American Meteorological Society, or the AMS, television seal of approval and became an AMS certified consulting meteorologist. He's authored, authored numerous papers on weather modification, droughts, hydrology, weather forecasting, and atmospheric pollution. On a personal note, Bob has been married for more than 45 years. Congratulations, Bob. Good job. And has three children, six grandkids. They're even better, right, than the yeah, kids. Right. He enjoys and loves the Black Hills for riding his motorcycle, fly fishing, hiking, playing golf tennis and skiing. And just so you all know, we're all envious. Bob just returned from Fort Myers, Florida. He just flew in uh, and to join us here at our journey discussion. But I am going to turn this journey discussion over to Mr. Bob Riggio. Thank you for joining us tonight, Bob. Thank you for being a part of our efforts of providing safe programming to our community. Uh, we would normally have had these programs in a theater and try to punch a bunch of people in there. Now we do all these things on Zoom. And people are kind of liking it. So thank you so much for joining yeah, us. They could just sit at home in their easy chair and just uh, put their little laptop up on, you know, in front of them and enjoy these talks. And I hope the folks out there enjoy my talk. And uh, my talk, there, there's the title, Behind the D-Day Weather Forecast. And it's the... the it, this topic is about the most critical and famous weather forecast ever in the history of this country. The forecast was launched, the forecast that launched the largest invasion fleet ever assembled in its time, folks. This is incredible. I just wanted to get this point across uh, at the very beginning. Uh, this forecast, I just want to 
try to emphasize how important this forecast was back in the 19, uh, 1944. This forecast that launched, it launched the largest invasion fleet ever assembled in its time. And that go, no go forecast uh, sat on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, shoulders of uh, General uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, the gentleman in the middle of that uh, photo as you, uh, you can see. And he fully understood these, that the, the successful execution of Operation Overlord, and, and that was the code name for the D-Day invasion, depended on a detailed and accurate D-Day weather forecast. And that is what I'll be talking about today, the goings on behind the D-Day uh, forecast. But first, uh, let me talk a little bit about, about myself. Uh, I know Troy mentioned a few things. Uh, under this umbrella of meteorology, there's a number of career paths that people can take, and I dub my toes into a number of those. Uh, forecasting, I, I forecast for the uh, U.S. Air Force at, in Barksdale Air Force Base. I forecast for KC-135s, B-52s. I also forecast for utilities. The utility companies need to know temperature, so they would know how many generators, generators to bring online or bring offline. It costs them a lot of money to do to bring a generator online. And if they don't need it, then they, they just lost some of that money. Also, a movie. Uh, believe it or not, I forecast for a movie, uh, The Bird on a Wire. This was back in the 70s, though, quite a while ago. Weather modification licenses and permits. I work for the, the Texas Department of Water Resources, and we issued... Uh, licenses and permits for weather modification, operational programs over West Texas. I did some cloud seeding research, the HyPlex program, uh, which is a acronym for the High Plains Experiment. And as Troy pointed out, some climatology studies, drought and rainfall studies, even as a certified consultant meteorologist that did some litigation, I was an expert witness and a number of uh, cases where weather was a part of the uh, of the trial and also did one up here in South Dakota as well. Uh, the TV part of it, yeah, I've done a little bit of that. Uh, I uh, was weekend weather, uh, did, did the weekend weather at the KSAT, KXAN, both of those are Texas uh, TV stations, WHO and Des Moines, Iowa. And of course, uh, KNBN, uh, New San Juan, right, right here in Rapid City. Air quality meteorology, I did a little bit of that as, as well. Uh, mostly ozone mitigation. And what we would do, we would use the, uh, a computer to, to simulate a high ozone event, an actual high ozone event. And of course, weather plays an important part in doing that. Uh, the Air Force, uh, I went in the Air Force. They sent me to uh, Penn State the University to get my degree in meteorology, got my bachelor's of science degree in meteorology. Uh, from there, I, I was stationed at Barksdale for five years, and as I said earlier, uh, forecast for B-52s, uh, KC-135s, and Barksdale is situated right between, uh, uh, right between Houston and Cape Canaveral, Houston and Cape Canaveral. Uh, the Barksdale is located uh, in Shreveport or, or Bossier City, Louisiana, so we had these astronauts, if they were in Cape Canaveral flying to Houston, they would tend to stop at Barksdale because Barksdale had a very nice recreational area. And then we had the Gemini astronauts flying through quite a bit, as well as the Apollo astronauts. And uh, one day uh, on a very foggy morning, as a matter of fact, it was walks off and walks off simply means uh, zero visibility, zero sailing. A T-38 that was pulled up in front of base ops. And when you have a T-38 pull up in front of base ops, you know it's a very important person. And that person walked up to the, uh, the weather forecast uh, center, the, uh, the desk, dropped a bag of fish on the, on the desk and wanted a weather briefing because he was going to take that T-38 and fly back to Houston. I briefed him. I said, uh, I said sir, you know, walks off. You're going to have to wait till this afternoon. He just kind of nodded his head, told me to sign the thing. I signed the thing. Fifteen minutes later, he took off, and that person turned out to be Jack Swigert, the Apollo 13 lunar module pilot that piloted a crippled uh, lunar module around the moon and, and back to Earth. So I figured if he could do that, he can certainly take off in walks off conditions. Uh, from there, uh, I got my master's degree from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology right here in Rapid City. 
And I was here for the 1972 Rapid City flood. And that's when I had up close and personal experience, just how powerful, how powerful moving water could be. My job uh, after that, the, the day after that flood was to go and, and uh, inspect cars that are, that are in, the, uh, in the creek and see if there's uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, corpses in those cars. And that, that, was, a, that was an eye opener. So I was there for that. And uh, as, as Troy pointed out, uh, I've been a, a meteorologist for over 50 years. Uh, in the last 20, I've been the chief meteorologist here at uh, New Center One. And I, I, I put all of my uh, experiences in this book uh, entitled Weather Legacy Half Century on the Job. Uh, it's about the weather in, in the Black Hills, but it's about 90% 90, 90 weather and about 10% a little bit about me. And, uh, and it's an easy read. And if you have any interest in weather, the South Dakota Magazine, they uh, wrote up an article about it. Uh, they, they reviewed it, and I'm really proud of this. They say, uh, Bob Riggio, a longtime chief meteorologist at Rapid City's KMBN TV, has written a book that delivers all the science you'll ever need about weather. And that's what I, I wanted to bring across. There's a, a little bit, of, well, quite a bit of science in there, but there's a lot of metaphors, so you, you can understand it rather easily. But there is much, much more, and there's some, uh, and they say Riggio is an outstanding uh, uh, storyteller. Um, I know it sounds like I'm trying to sell a book. I, I, I just, I just want it, to let you know, folks, that book is out there. And if you have any interest in weather, just go to RiggioWeather.com, and you could page through the first 15 pages just to see if it's uh, something you might be, you might be interested in. And as Troy pointed out, this Saturday at 1030 to noon, I'll be here at the Journey Museum. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing the book, I'll be certainly be happy uh, to sign it. Uh, the last chapter of the book, Past Weather Events, and uh, in there, the, the, I talk about the 72 flood, the winter storm atlas, the children's blizzard, the Spencer tornado, uh, the Dust Bowl, just to name a few of the things, but uh, also the story behind the D-Day weather forecast. And, and in that chapter is where you will find the subchapter, the subchapter titled Behind the D-Day Weather Forecast. And as I said earlier, the weather forecast is for the largest fleet ever assembled in its time. 176,000 troops made landfall in northern France on D-Day. 176,000 troops. 5,000 ships were deployed to uh, provide uh, artillery cover and as well as a landing craft were needed. And, and each one of these, uh, of this equipment needed specific weather information, a specific weather uh, forecast. Also 8,500 aircraft were deployed during D-Day. And these are the gentlemen that uh, had to come up with uh, how they're gonna put all this together, how they're gonna make this, uh, make this work. And uh, much discussion with, uh, with uh, General Eisenhower senior staff uh, establish the decision-making process and the desired weather conditions that they needed for D-Day. And of course, the first thing they had to decide on the number of personnel, they had to come up with a number of personnel. Once they've decided on that, then the equipment to support uh, this personnel. And then the logistics, how are they going to get all this uh, into England and how are they going to get it across uh, the canal to Northern France? And can you imagine if the weather forecast was wrong? All of that, the personnel, the equipment, the logistics, all of that uh, deteriorates into a, uh, a hell in a handbasket. Just no good. If uh, a fog bank moved into uh, northern France on D-Day, low visibility, zero visibility, uh, the bombers won't be able to find their targets. Uh, uh, the uh, the the ships will not be able to provide cover for the landing craft and the, and the people making landfall. The weather was extremely, extremely important. And it was a difficult forecast to make simply because uh, each, uh, each piece of equipment needed a different forecast. Bombers, 
the bombers, they needed, they, they wanted clear skies, paratroopers, they coveted cloudy skies. So we got uh, a dichotomy here. Bombers wanted clear skies, paratroopers didn't want, they, you know, paratroopers want a cloudy sky so they, they're not being shot at as they you know, the paratroop down. The amphibian, the landing craft, they wanted onshore winds to reduce wave action. The larger naval ships providing uh, cover, they preferred offshore winds. Uh, landing, they wanted to land during low tide to uh, un uh, uncover water obstacles. So they, we you know, the forecast uh, had to be during a time of low tide. And they also wanted three subsequent days of good weather to resupply uh, the, uh, the invasion forces. So all of these things were uh, just a, a dichotomy of, of one another. It was a very difficult decision to come up with the minimum desired weather conditions needed. So uh, after much discussion among uh, the uh, commanders of the different invasion forces, a minimum acceptable weather forecast was finally agreed upon. And this is what, the, this is what uh, General Eisenhower wanted. He wanted a full moon within one day before four days after the invasion. He wanted near calm seas in the forecast. He wanted visibility three miles or greater uh, cloud cover less than three tenths below 8,000 feet and cloud bases above 3,000 feet. This is, this is what, I mean, it was a give and take. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, was, uh, uh, it wasn't the greatest forecast for everybody, but it, it provided uh, some security for each of the invasion uh, uh, forces. Uh, historically, uh, the climatology was definitely not on their side. Historical weather records concluded that only a slim probability at best existed of ever seeing these desired weather conditions on the beaches of northern France. A slim probability uh, during June, maybe one day, one day out of uh, 13. This is, this, is what I, this is what I found interesting. This is a, a quote from uh, uh, General Eisenhower. I know a little, about, a little bit about the science of meteorology and certainly nothing about what reliance can be put on it for forecasting in England. But as the day will soon come when a weather forecast may be, criti may be a critical factor in an important decision which I shall have to make, I alone shall have to make, I want the first-hand experience, not just of the forecast. I, th th this I underline because I think this is important. I want to know my meteorological advisors and what they can do. I want to know when and how far I can trust them. And the reason for that, there are basically four ingredients that goes into a forecast. The science, the experience, storage of data, and yes, sometimes luck, luck. And co computers nowadays, they, uh, you could cram all the science you want, you could, all the experience, you could cram in 100 years of experience in, into these huge computer brains. Uh, storage, uh, they, they, they're, they're receiving data from around the world and they have the storage capability of ingesting all of, all of that data. Much less human vol involvement as much, much more data, history, and experience can be stuffed into computer, into a computer brain than into a human brain. And computers, as you can see here, not only do they uh, do, they do the, uh, the plotting and the analysis, but they also observe the weather. We have uh, just out here at the, uh, at the airport, we have an automatic weather station all the data comes in. We used to have weather observers at uh, airports. Now we have automatic weather stations. They ingest the, the data and they send it off to uh, Maryland uh, in Washington into these huge computers. They regurgitate it, do the analysis, and within literally, literally minutes, you have a forecast. You have a forecast because of the computer power. Uh, nowadays, and you could see that map on the right. That's what comes out uh, within, really within minutes of once the data is collected from all over the country, all over the world. Uh, these computers are able to spit out a uh, an analysis of all that data. 
And folks, uh, we got universities coming up with these computer models. We have private agencies, government agencies coming up, and there's just a, a few of them listed right there. Back in 1944, the meteorologists did not have computers. The science, the experience, and the storage was all done by the hands-on grunt work of a human person. It wasn't a, there wasn't computers, and it was just the, all of this came from the human brain. And, and that's the reason why I think General Eisenhower wanted to know the meteorologist, wanted to know how much he could, he could trust him. And uh, even the, uh, the, the weather observations were, were from ships uh, in the water. Anywhere that they could get a weather observation, they certainly, it certainly wasn't as uh, coordinated as it is today. As a matter of fact, uh, the women in World War II, many of the women were weather observers. And uh, that data was collected by hand, sent via teletype, via code. Uh, someone received it and they would uh, plot up that particular weather station. And then a plot would look like this. And those plots were then uh, all the weather stations across uh, England. And then someone would have to analyze that. Someone would have to analyze that. So this was definitely a human uh, process, not a computer process back in 1944. And that's why uh, General Eisenhower said, I want to know my meteorological advisors and what they can do. I want to know when and how far I can trust them. And these are the, uh, these are the meteorologists that had the job to brief uh, General Eisenhower. Uh, uh, Colonel Don Yates from the US, he, was the, he had the deputy post. The senior post went to uh, uh, Captain James Stagg. He was with uh, New England. He was the one that, that gave uh, General Eisenhower the forecast. Now, here comes the, the hard part. You, you've heard this term before. If you have one watch, you always know what time it is. If you have two watches, you never know what time it is. How about having three watches? If you have three watches, how in the world will you ever know what the real time is? And that's what Colonel Yakes and uh, Captain Stagg had to deal with. They had three weather centers, each with a different forecasting method. Uh, the U.S. Strategic Air Force Center, the Royal Air Force Weather Group, and the Royal Navy Weather Group. So there were three forecast centers coming up with a forecast. They would pass it on to Colonel Yakes and Captain Stagg. They would ingest this as best they could, and they had to make a decision as to which one they were going to brief uh, General Eisenhower with. The U.S. Uh, Strategic Air Force Center was known as Wide Wing. Their forecast, each of the centers had different forecast methods. Uh, Wide Wing's uh, forecast method was weather typing. In other words, they would look at uh, the uh, current weather synoptic situation, and then they would go back in their files and look for a similar sit uh, weather synoptic situation that agrees with what they're seeing today. And then using those files, they would check out, well, what happened the next day back 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever? What happened the next day? What happened the second day? What happened the third day? And that's how they would base their forecast. And uh, Irving P. Crick was the, the lead man in the U.S. Strategic uh, Air Force Center. And that's how he made his forecast. Uh, the uh, second group was the uh, Royal uh, the Royal Air Force Group uh, and uh, they use synoptic reasoning. In other words, when the observers would uh, send in their observations for each of their stations around England as um, then uh, they would uh, plot up, you know, locate where the fronts are, locate where the high pressure systems are, where the low pressure systems are, look at pressure changes, draw in a front and look at pressure changes. And, and from there, uh, predict where the front or where the low, where the high would go over the next three hours or the next six hours or the next 12 hours. So they would use uh, synoptic reasoning and 
Severe Pedersen was the head man there uh, coming up with, with those forecasts. And then the final group was the Royal Navy group. Uh, and they, they used practical reasons, uh, reasoning. Uh, they were just naval meteorologists. They said, yeah, I remember a day like today and yesterday it cleared out. So that's, that's, how, that's how they came up with their forecast. And uh, Captain uh, Stagg was uh, a part of, of that group as well. So the weekly, uh, the weekly weather briefing, the meteorolo meteorologist Stagg would brief General Eisenhower and the Air, Ground, and Naval Commanders uh, in Chief and their staff every Monday on the week's forecast. So they would provide the briefing every Monday on the week's forecast and uh, for the weekly briefings, Thursday was always D-Day. Thursday was always D-Day. And of course, you have the, uh, the three weather groups. You're going to have conflicts, the experience, personality, and disposition of the principals managing each of the three weather centers range the entire psychological and professional spectrum. Disagreements were the rule, not the exception. Disagreements were the rule, not the exception uh, among those uh, three different weather groups. And uh, this is one uh, area of disagreement. This is the map for June the 5th, 1944. This is what it was, this is the way it looked. And, and, and this front right here, well, let, let me point out, here, here's England, here's Northern France right here. So this is the area where the invasion would, would take place somewhere right through here. And this is the front that there was a lot of disagreement about. The uh, Wed Wing Center, that's Crick and Holzman, they thought the front would be further to the west, away from um, northern France, and high pressure would be building in behind that. So they said July, that should be not uh, that should be uh, June, the, June the 5th, I'm sorry, June the 5th. They said go. We need to have a go on, on June the 5th. Uh, Yates and the Admiralty Center also said go, but the Royal Air Force Center, headed by Pedersen and Douglas, said no go. No go. So Stagg had to come up with, what am I going to do, brief uh, go or no go? He decided to go with Pedersen, and he briefed no go. No go because he strongly felt that this front – draped across uh, uh, Europe there would be too close to uh, Northern France and it would, it would cause uh, uh, the weather not be cohesive to uh, uh, an invasion force. Whereas Crick believed that this trough right through here, this high pressure would be a further off uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, to the uh, east, and it would be, show improving weather. So there was a, there was a conflict on June the fifth. However, on uh, on Saturday, June the third, Stag finally had an agreed to forecast. He briefed the commanders in chief that the passage of a powerful cold front that we just pointed out across the channel would bring gale force winds by late Sunday, June the fourth, and early Monday, June the fifth along with nearly overcast clouds, low ceilings, and stormy uh, conditions. The June 6, 1944 forecast called for 50% or less cloud cover with bases at 2,000 feet to 3,000 feet, as well as decreasing winds from Monday afternoon until at least dawn on Tuesday, June the 6th, or possibly longer. In short, the forecast called for less than ideal conditions for a June 6 assault but tolerable conditions. So the agreed to the forecast, again, we're going to the June 5th, was that this ridge of high pressure will be, the, will be closer to the uh, northern France, providing some tolerable conditions for the invading force to make landfall. So June the 6th was decided. So finally, an agreed to forecast was made after consulting with his staff and commanders. Ike said, I don't like it, but there it is. I don't see how we can do anything else. I say we go. D-Day was set to go for early June 6. And some time ago, I interviewed uh, Wayne Brewster, who landed on Omaha Beach a few minutes after H hour, or that's the hour of the attack at 6.30 a.m. He recalls the uh, terrible sea conditions at the uh, em embarking area. 
He says, and I quote myself and Corporal Stakovich were delegated to be the first to go down the landing net to our landing craft vehicle personnel, LCVP. We were combat engineers and heavily loaded. Besides my pack, my load included 25 pounds of TNT. I was one of the smallest guys, so my load was light. We were ordered on, for, uh, we were ordered on first because of the heavy seas. Still huge ways because of, still huge way because of an early storm. To help the other men off the landing net to avoid injuries if possible. If someone tried to get off the net as the boat was dropping, serious injury could happen. And if the boat was coming up, the same could happen. It goes without saying that we all were seasick. So conditions were not ideal. They were just not ideal on June the 6th, 1944. So in summary, the Allied uh, forecasters saw the slight break in the weather coming, albeit slight, that allowed the D-Day invasion. The German meteorologists did not. Con consequently, the German defenders were caught somewhat by surprise, thinking the forecast weather conditions would delay an attack. In January 1961, while riding with, General, with uh, John F. Kennedy to his inauguration, I told JFK that, the Allies probably prevailed because of superior meteorologists. German meteorologists, however, were not inferior. The data to them was. So that is the story, as best as I can tell it, behind the D-Day weather forecast. Bob, I want to thank you uh, for sharing that. It's incredible. Uh, I know when we sat down in our conference room and we talked about this program and you talked about the connections here to D-Days um, and, and it's just so fascinating to me and, and maybe you could provide some insights into um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, for him to create these or I don't know if he created them or if he inherited these divergent opinions uh, of the sciences there um, they, they comment did. on that I mean uh, it, 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 it almost seems like a wouldn't work well, but I guess perhaps it worked well because you had to kind of iron it out between them. Yeah, you had uh, Captain Stagg who had to make the final decision. So he had to, you know, listen to all three groups. And then he had to come up with what he thought was the best forecast of the three groups. And they had the three groups. They weren't located together. They were located miles apart just in case um, – a bombing attack from the uh, from the Germans would wipe out one of the groups. They always had an, another group to provide forecasts for. Well, I, I, you know, I get that's a point I didn't think about. I mean, they were at war, and so they were creating kind of tiers of redundancy, I guess, to be able to make oh, sure yeah. they're making those exactly. good decisions. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think that's really fascinating. I, I'm not sure. If something, it, that's a history story, but I mean, could you see something like that happening uh, today where there would be that many diverse opinions of what is happening with weather? Or is it just because of the computer drives uh, out there that? There, there are still different opinions about a forecast. And those opinions are based on which forecast model would I use? And each model and, and I, I showed a number of them, and there's many more than that. But each model has, has a, their strength and weaknesses, and it's up to the meteorologist to decide which um, model best forecasts, let's say, snow, which best forecasts rainfall, which best forecasts severe weather. So there's still some decision-making processes among, uh, among forecasters. But back then, back then you didn't have – that luxury, you, you, you had um, to, to do all the work yourself. You had, uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground and, uh, and, and, and you didn't have the, the forecast, you didn't have the information available to you as quickly as they do nowadays. Um, uh, just a reminder, folks, you guys can send a question in to me while we're having our journey discussion here. 
Uh, and I got a little note, Bob, that I wanted to share, which reminded me to remind everybody that they could send questions in while we're talking. But uh, one of our viewers thanking you for a great presentation on American history and letting us know that uh, their grandfather fought in World War II would have really enjoyed seeing your program and just highly complimentary. So thank you for the kudos. I wanted to pass that on to Bob and also let you guys know you can also shoot other questions into me here while we're having a discussion on the weather. Um, Bob, I know uh, our theme here is history, um, but I can't help, you know, with you having written a book and you've been on the job here 50 years, I mean, obviously you've seen a lot of events in the Black Hills. Is there one specific personal event that might stand? I mean, the flood, you brought it up in your program, but I mean, personally, is there some other, another specific event that, you know, you can really recall and, and provide you with some oh. thoughts and memories. Oh yeah. Um, Atlas, winter storm Atlas. Um, we, uh, uh, yeah. uh, New Santa One has never, ever failed to put out a newscast. And if we were ever going to not be able to put out a newscast, that was, that was during winter, uh, winter storm Atlas. I mean, we just had people left the station that evening to go home. And there was a few of us left at the station. Uh, and we, we tried to get out of the parking lot. We couldn't get out. We were stuck there. So we had to spend a night there. So, we had to, there was just five of us and you normally need a lot more people than just five to put out a newscast, but there was just five of us and each one of us had to wear a different hat, you know, uh, like I ran camera. I never ran camera before, but I ran camera then. <laughs> but Justin Wickersham, he anchored, plus he did some interviews. So we had people that were stuck outside the, the block away from the station that came they came in, so we interviewed them. We had a director who directed one time. He directed the show, but we were able through paper clips and gum and whatever else to put together a newscast that evening. And then that's something I I think about a lot. I was really proud of that. But with a bare bones staff, extremely bare bones staff. Uh, we were able to put out a newscast. It's, it's sometimes the worst circumstances that bring out our best moments, right? Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. I have a really interesting question here, Bob, that came in. Um, and it, in, in your researching, did you find anything about covert and overt operations between the Axis and Ally weather forecasters? Um, the gentleman asking questions said he knew that they both had a present in the North Atlantic, North Atlantic. Um, uh, that's yeah. a, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I, I hope I did it well in reading that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you mean did they work together? I'm sure that there must've been some covert, uh, able to get weather data, uh, you know, current weather observations from the Germans. Uh, I would think that's possible. I don't know if it happened, but I think it's possible. It was possible back then. And they can certainly needed that information to come up with their, their forecast. It's particularly uh, Pedersen, Severe Pedersen, we're doing his synoptic analysis. He, the more data, the more observations you have, the easier it is to, to look at pressure differences, what's going on over the last three hours, are the pressures increasing, decreasing, and that, and which way are the winds blowing? Which way are the winds blowing? That that could tell how fast a particular front will be moving through the area. So I I, I haven't read anything about covert operations like that. But but yes, it, uh, more that we talk about it, you know. I mean, there were um, the French. They did a lot of covert uh, uh, during uh, occupancy uh, Germany. Uh, the German occupancy of France. And I'm sure they were able to provide weather information to these uh, three weather groups. Well, I, I thought that was a great question. So thanks for uh, sending that one in to us and making us think about that a little bit. We start talking covert and overt yeah. <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, 
Hey, uh, Bob, I mean, I got a weather guy here, so I got to ask this, uh, this type of a question here. But, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about global warming. Uh, you've studied, you're in the sciences here. Uh, do you want to lean in on that topic? I know it's got nothing to do with the D-Day's weather, but I just, uh, you know, I want to hear your thought process on that. It's in the book. Uh, it's in the book. Okay. Hey, we are selling the book Saturday. Just said, I know Bob said he's not selling books, but I am. So I'll sell them for you. Uh, I, hope, you know, yeah, I didn't want it to sound like I'm selling a book. Uh, I just want to make the make people aware that the book is available if they have an interest in weather. And they could go to, to regioweather.com and they can page through the first 15 pages. And if it's something that they might be interested in, I'll be here Saturday morning, 1030 to noon sign a book or you can order the book through that website uh uh yeah yeah uh, yeah i'm just trying to help you bob i mean everybody should know our presenters give their time and uh one of the things that one of the little small things we can do here at the museum is give some people the opportunity uh and so we're just trying to help bob get the book out there and i, I appreciate bob giving us his time tonight so i know i was being a little flippant but the reality is, is that I would love for uh, Bob to get as much support as possible uh, while he's here because we appreciate being able to have this type of a program tonight. So thank you, yeah. Bob, for doing this for us, too. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, so I've got another question is here in the queue. Uh, you gave info on what the different groups needed for successful invasion. Do you have any info on how the actual weather for June 6th, help or hindered the Allies? Because you know how they all had their preferences. Wayne Brewster was there. Uh, I, I quoted him, and he said that the, the seas were extremely rough, extremely rough. Uh, and some areas, the, the forecast, I mean, northern France, you know, they had different beaches, Omaha Beach, et cetera, et cetera. And the weather was different at each of those uh, each of those beaches. Um, the cloud cover was more than what they wanted, so many of the uh, bombers could not locate their target. That was a problem. Uh, the, the the weather was not ideal, as they say. It wasn't ideal, but we were able to to, to make landfall with many of the landing craft. Uh, the 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 waves were pretty strong. Many of the landing craft uh, sank with people on board. Um, but for the most part, we were able to get the, the numbers of uh, infantry on the beaches that were needed to be on the beaches. Uh, artillery from the ships, they were able to hit their targets to provide some, uh, some support. So, I mean, there were some good parts and, you know, good aspects of the forecast and, and not so good aspects. It wasn't an ideal forecast for D-Day. Well, I think you kind of hit it on the head when you said that uh, it wasn't as, as expected because of the weather uh, on the other side of the coin. There. So while it was difficult for our troops, perhaps could, them not expecting it because of the you weather. Probably, you probably, I mean, the weather never improved. It did improve three or four days later. It cleared out, and that allowed uh, the supply ships to come in and, and supply the troops that were uh, that made landfall. That was a good thing. But you didn't want clear weather either. You know, you wanted something in between terrible weather and clear weather to accommodate. You know, the bombers to accommodate the ships to accommodate the wind direction, the, the waves, and, and everything. It was just a, a, a tough, tough, tough forecast. Yeah, it, it, it was it was probably never going to be satisfying for all of the different uh, groups there, as you pointed out. Um, so, no, it, 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 it kind of played as best it did. Um, so I've got a question in here. Uh, interesting to see the women involved with the forecasting. This seems to be an ever emerging topic of how great of an impact that was made during the time by women, by by women yeah. overall. Did this event make an impact on the vital importance of this science and service and specifically for women doing this type of work and being accepted? I hope so. I hope so. But uh, I don't think they were the, 
in, in the forecasting, but they did do the plotting. They did do the weather observations. They, they collected the data. They uh, documented the wind directions, wind speed, temperatures, dew points, uh, uh, pressure, all of that stuff. Uh, and they made those plots uh, for each of the stations. And uh, that was their uh, contribution, which was extremely important, extremely important to do for the meteorologists who just, in, in this case, happened to all be men to uh, analyze uh, the synoptic charts and then make a forecast off of that. So you could probably, <laughs> and I think that's a great point. And I know part of what we've tried to do it here at the museum is try to uncover those types of stories too in history where maybe perhaps that hasn't been reported as much. And I appreciate you bringing light to that and the roles of women uh, in, in that role there. I have a, for fun comment, I'll share with you, Bob, I'm sure you'll agree with uh, apparently one of our viewers uh, whose father was in aviation weather, uh, he always used to say it's easier to report weather than it is to forecast it. So yeah. I, figured, I figured you'd appreciate that comment. <laughs> forecast is right somewhere. It, it, it's always right on somewhere. Maybe not in that person's backyard, maybe in their neighbor's backyard. Or The seven-day forecast might not be in the right order, right? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's right. Well, no, no, no. You know, I hear that a lot. Forecasts have improved tremendously, tremendously. Again, we go back to the computer brain. These computers, you know, myself, I, I can't go back 100 years and recall what happened in 100 years. I can't plot data from around the country or around the Northern Hemisphere in, in minutes. I can't do that, but computers can. Therefore, forecasts have gotten better, much better. A, a, a three-day forecast 10 years ago, um, a five-day forecast now is, is as accurate as a three-day forecast was 10 years ago. Well, it's like your comment, too, that there's weather spotters and watchers. So, you know, that information yeah. is not comely, but it's being plotted in by computers and gathered and you can trend it from there. So I'm sure there's amazing amount of uh, detail that we couldn't have even begun to try to gather 30 mm -hmm. years ago. Well, um, Bob, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Uh, I've got no open questions right now. I'll just kind of shout out there to everybody. If the, we're down to our last few minutes, but you know, I'd love to give Bob the opportunity to talk about or add anything that he would like to tonight's program without any prompts from myself or from you guys. So, Bob, it's all your floor here. I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about the D-Day forecast. Uh, uh, I, I, again, uh, it, it, it brings to mind how difficult it was back then to come up with a forecast, especially when you have those three groups each group using a different method of forecasting. Uh, Pedersen using the synoptic reasoning, that's what computers use nowadays, basically. Um, Crick, who I met a number of times in cloud seeding, he, was, uh, he, he believed strongly in cloud seeding, uh, using ground-based generators, putting silver iodide up into the clouds, thinking hopefully it would rain more. Uh, his approach has always been, all right, you show me a synoptic map today, I'll go back, however far back I need to go, find one just like that, and then I'll use the next, the, from that point on, I'll look at the next day's weather maps and I'll be able to forecast the weather that way. Weather's too dynamic, much too dynamic to assume that because one weather map today, it looks like a weather map 10 years ago, then today's forecast is gonna be the same as 10 years ago. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, it's, it's more involved with synoptic reasoning, uh, looking at the changes in the pressure, looking at changes in the winds and, and uh, sea surface temperature now. Sea surface temperature is, is being included in these models because these models have the ability to, to absorb all of this data. I mean, they have the memory and the storage power to do that. It's just, it's just incredible. So forecasts have improved quite a bit and they'll continue to improve. Believe me. And, and, you know, in the science of all of that, it's just, it's all the data and the detail 
and the more that you can add to that. And so, I mean, that's what the computers can do for us. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah. Forecasting low temperatures is, the, it's luck. I mean, that, that I, 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 an elevation of uh, what, 20 feet could drop a temperature of five degrees, 10 degrees. It's, it's incredible. So. Well, your, your luck is an educated guess though too, right, Bob? Uh, yeah, you just want to present. I've always, my philosophy has always been, I'm going to tell you it's going to rain. I'm going to tell you it's going to be warm. I'm going to tell you it's going to be cold. You know, here's the reasons why it's going to, you know, we, we expect the rain. Everybody's not going to get an inch of rain. Everybody's not going to get uh, two inches of rain. Some people may not get no rain, but if you're forecasting for a big area like we forecast over northwest South Dakota, northeastern Wyoming, and portions of, you know, one for one forecast isn't going to satisfy everybody. That's for sure. Well, I think keeping it simple is helpful, though, too. <laughs> it's so stupid. That was an uh, acronym in the KISS was the acronym. acronym. Yeah. Or keep it simple, silly. You know, we'll be nice instead of yeah. saying the other one. <laughs> well, uh, everybody who's uh, on here, I, I think we, we've gotten a few kudos and thank yous. And uh, I think we're going to be wrapping up soon. But again, just just so everybody knows, uh, Bob's book, he's been in the business for 50 years. And we thank you for being in the Black Hills and serving our community. Uh, tune in, KNBN. You'll be on tonight. Uh, I'll be on tonight. Yeah. Call in the weather. Or you squeeze this in in between. Uh, took time off of the uh, of the early evening broadcast so you could be here tonight with us, and we're dearly thankful. But Bob will be here Saturday from ten thirty to noon. So if you guys want to stop in, chat with him a little bit, um, get a copy of the book. Uh, we, we would appreciate you supporting him, and we thank you for supporting the Journey Museum and Learning Center. Uh, and we're going to close tonight. I always close by saying somehow, some way the journey will continue and I'm sure weather will continue too, Bob. Uh, so good night, everybody. And thank you for joining us for our journey discussion. Okay. Good night.